Looking for some sweet new Dungeon and Dragons Adventures in the Forgotten Realms cards? Well, you can pre-order them all now from our sponsor, Card Kingdom, by heading over to cardkingdom.com. Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Afran Olive, and we have a super fun video today. So over the last you know, week, a little more than a week, we've been talking about adventures in the Forgotten Realms in various constructed formats, from standard to modern to historic to commander. Well, today it is time to talk about one of my all-time favorite formats and one of the most powerful formats in all of Magic, and that is Legacy into break down the top 10 legacy cards from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. We are joined by This Week in Legacy and Vintage 101 and also D&D Adventure writer Joe Dyer. Joe, how's it going today? I'm doing great, Seth. How are you doing? I am doing awesome. I am uh, super excited to talk about Adventures in the Forgotten Realms in Legacy. It seems like we have some pretty interesting stuff to talk about. So uh, the plan today is pretty simple. We got 10 cards. We're going to go from 10 down to one, break them down, talk about their potential impact on the Legacy format. So I guess we might as well just jump right into it and start at number 10 on our list, which is Tasha's Hideous Laughter, a card I find really interesting. I did a lot of uh, a lot of work on kind of mathing out what this card might do in various matchups. How good do you think it is in Legacy? I've heard people ask about this, and I've seen I've seen kind of two things when I was looking at the math. On one hand, some Legacy decks are really low to the ground, and that makes you think that exiling cards until you hit 20 mana value is going to hit a ton of cards. On the other hand... Legacy is also a Force of Will format, so a lot of decks have 20 mana value of Force of Wills alone, even though they're casting them for free. How do you think that all shakes out, Joe? How good is Tasha's Hideous Laughter in Legacy? I think this card is on the lower end possible playability. I think that if a mill deck finally ends up existing in Legacy, that this could be like your finisher kind of yeah. card for that kind of deck. It's also really good if lands suddenly becomes much more prominent in the format, because lands is probably one of the decks that this hurts the most. Uh, yeah. Because I <laughs> it plays so many lands in the deck that you're more than likely to either one casting or two castings to basically exile a bunch of cards. Yeah, I think with, like, the typical lands build, especially, like, pre-sideboarding, there's a pretty decent chance that a single Tasha Sidious Laughter might exile their entire deck, depending on the game state. Worst case, two will definitely do it, which, I don't know, could this be, like, let's say lands get super popular. Is there any way you, like, bring this in as your sideboard card against lands? Like, could that even be a possibility? Or is this just, like, purely, like a mill deck card that goes up in value in a matchup like lands. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that it could be good for that. I mean, the blue-red Delver decks are currently playing a sideboard copy of, like, Court of Cunning, uh, which yeah. is kind of interesting. So, like, yes, that is repeatable, but this could also be used to just exile win conditions from a deck. So, I, I, I don't know. It's interesting to try, but there are a lot of decks in Legacy that do get above 20 pretty quickly because, like you said, Force of Will, and it's not just that, all the Delver decks are now playing cards like Murktide Regent and uh, Force of Negation, and they're all four days decks, and that's a lot. It stacks up really quickly. And don't even get started on 12 post. <laughs> oh, God. That's, yeah. That's probably, you, you mill like two cards or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, just to even the fact that like the uh, colorless versions are playing, you know, Thought Not Seer and Reality Smasher. So, yeah. That adds, yeah. that adds a pretty quick. I, it's I, definitely an interesting card, though. I, I'd say maybe against Storm, too, also is also a possibility because those decks are also um, ad nauseum decks. And so they tend to keep their curve pretty low to not die to ad nauseum. So that's another deck that it could be used against. But Storm is on the low end of the playability in the format right now a little bit because of all the various fair decks having a lot of answers to it. So... Well, let's move on to number nine on our list. Number nine on our list, we got a card that I think if it shows up in Legacy, there's probably one specific deck it's going to go in, which is Hobgoblin Bandit Lord. Obviously a goblin card. Mm -hmm. Legacy Goblin's got a lot of options. Is this good enough, you think, to show up in Legacy Goblins, Joe? I could see it maybe as a one-of. 
Like it does, it does a decent impression of being a lord. First of all, a lord effect is always nice, and it's a two three lord, so that's even better. So you're already kind of dodging plague engineer with this card by itself. Whereas a lot of lords don't tend to dodge multiple plague engineers. Goblin chieftain, for example, is a two two, and that doesn't really dodge to two plague engineer. So uh, this card is a two three. It dodges in. Uh, this is really good if you like put this into play and you've got a haste enabler and like muxus, and uh, suddenly you're turning your stuff into a, a like a goblin war strike kind of effect, and then you're able to like curve that into sling gang lieutenant or patchalik mons, or what's the other card? Shoot. Um, skirt uh yeah I, I don't remember offhand. <laughs> they run so many different different kinds yeah. of sacrifice of that cars but definitely definitely sling gang lieutenant is like the big thing for yeah this kind skirt, of card. skirt prospector it might have been what you were thinking yeah, of possibly yeah. i think that's other sack outlet yeah i i think the thing about this card that i like in goblins is goblins kind of a, a tutor based deck with goblin matron so a goblin doesn't necessarily have to be four of good. I see like some of the recent builds of goblins, which I don't know if this is actually uh, like standard or not, but someone play like a single goblin ringleader, which mm-hmm. is a card that I would expect you to play a lot. But when you have so many tutors in your deck, you can play cards as a one of and still find them. You have haste enablers in the deck already, like goblin war chief. Uh, you can hit it off Muxus, as you said. So I don't know if I would imagine this card being a four of in goblins, but I could certainly seeing it being a very solid one of and it offers a little bit more removal and a way to just deal direct damage another way to uh, maybe win through like ensnaring bridges and things like that which i think is kind of a neat addition on top of a relatively on curve lord so it's got that going for it at least yep i like it it's a neat card well let's move on to number eight on our list we're sticking with the goblin cards kind of den of the bugbear one of the new creature lands and i'm really curious to hear where this fits in legacy uh creature lands are not super heavily played i guess uh i don't think in legacy in my experience but these ones come into play untapped early in the game is that part of the reason why this cycle or this card might show up com- uh, compared to like the world wake cycle or whatever that comes into play tap and sees modern play but just doesn't typically make it in legacy yeah i think the untapped capability of this card makes it kind of interesting I could see this in some form of the red aggro decks that are basically kind of like the Blood Moon decks in the matchups where Blood Moon itself is not such a good card. That's yeah. kind of where I'm thinking, because it's basically a Goblin Rabble Master. It, if you it look is at it very that, similar. So, so it kind of fills a similar role. And I, I could I could see it. It's a neat card. Uh, I think it's probably one of the more flexible ones of the cycle outside of the green one, which I'm not sure if that one is any good, but this one is good because it generates multiple bodies. Yeah, the multiple bodies are definitely a big deal here. And I think even in a deck like Mono Red Prison or whatever it's called, like being able to come into play untapped the first couple of turns, really key when you're trying to like stick a chalice on one or something like that. Like having a land that comes into play tap is especially brutal. So that is a nice upside. And even mm-hmm. if you do end up blood mooning it, I mean, it's not the end of the world. You blood moon away your ancient tombs and city of traders and so forth. It's, it's still a mountain. It'll still tap for mana. So I kind of like that as a potential home, too. I also am interested in the green one. I know the red one is the one on our list here. Do you think there's any chance that can show up in, like, Primeval Titan style decks? I think that was kind of, like, the most interesting home to, like, snag it with a Primeval Titan and maybe some sort of cloud post or land style deck and just have it be a backup plan, like a one of and you have a ton of mana and you just smash people with the layer of the hydra <laughs> yeah that could be yeah like that that definitely could be a thing that you could do it definitely seems like it'd be very interesting to try well let's move on to number seven on our list we got another really interesting card grim wander a pretty above the curve two drop is a five three it even has flash the downside is it can only be cast if a creature died this turn where does this one fit in legacy joe this could actually be a goblins card too if you were more in a, like an aggressive goblins style deck because if you consider that you can just put this directly into play with goblin lackey that is something that can just happen uh and then if your opponent kills your goblin lackey you can just play this anyways 
So that's that's I actually honestly, until you mentioned this right now, I did not realize this card was a goblin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, today I, yeah. Today I learned. <laughs> yeah, it is a goblin. Uh, and so the other thing is that deck also plays Mogwar Marshall. And so this goes really well with like Mogwar Marshall uh, sacking it to the Echo Trigger and then being able to play a flash in this 5 3. So. Yeah, and and you also can ether violet into play even without mm-hmm. a creature dying. So there's yeah. there's actually like a lot of shenanigans to get this into play, and it is a pretty above the curve body. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, maybe that does actually have a chance. That's a really interesting idea. I was wondering where you were going this with this one. I was wondering if there was like some sacrifice deck that I wasn't aware of, like zombie bombardment or something. But mm. goblins makes way more sense to me. Yep, goblins just keeps getting way more like toys to develop into different versions of the deck and i think that's really interesting honestly yeah it is always cool when there's some variety even within an archetype so yeah where you can even when you see it's goblins there could be a few different things and maybe there's one that can take advantage of grim wanderer that would definitely be sweet mm-hmm. well let's move on to number six on our list we have treasure vault this is a card that when we did our modern list it was very high because it's an untapped artifact land which is exactly what affinity wants when i saw it show up on the legacy list i was assuming okay probably a card for affinity style decks but in legacy you get the original artifact lands too where does this fit in legacy joe i think this could be good in any deck that's probably seeking to abuse urza saga which is a lot of decks right now uh, even as like a one of as a late game to turn this into a couple different treasure tokens in order to boost your constructs seems Ooh. pretty good i also think it could be good in like the cloud post decks as a way to generate color mana that's actually that's a that's a really good point i hadn't really thought about using this to boost your constructs but yeah i mean getting up to what four mana six mana and making two or three treasures that is a pretty big boost of power to close out the game a lot quicker which uh is exactly what you want to be doing yeah that's a that's a really a really interesting idea yeah i think it's a it's definitely got potential I think there's uh, some, sh- there probably could be some shell that could take advantage of this. Yeah, I mean, whenever you see an artifact land, it's worth taking note of <laughs> yeah. because they're just historically so powerful. And this one comes into play tap and has an upside of potentially making even more artifacts. So let's keep moving forward. Number five on our list, we have our first class enchantment, Paladin class. Paladin class, it's only one mana, and it has not a hard form of hate, but what I imagine is actually a pretty obnoxious first level, making your opponent's spells cost one more to cast during your turn. When I think of Legacy, I'm thinking of Dazes, Enforce of Wills, and all these counter spells that let people tap out but still cast them. Is Paladin class a way to punish those kind of decks and those cards, or what are you thinking? Yeah, I think it would be, there's definitely a place for a card like this where you want to be able to resolve your spells and not have to worry about days or force a will or something like that. And I think this is a card that does that. I think if you curve this into like Thalia, uh, this is not bad <laughs> because then you're taxing your opponent's non-creature spells anyways, but then you're also taxing them more on your turn and it makes it harder for them to interact with your game plan. And then, yeah, and then the the level up ability is just kind of like icing. Like, you're able to, like, get a mini anthem out of it. And also, if you activate the last ability, suddenly you're attacking with double strike creatures, so... Yeah, so really, I think it's something that, especially in Legacy, you're playing it probably mostly for that first mode, but having that mana sink is nice. Like, when things go wrong and you run out of action, I I imagine, like, going back to, like, a Thalia deck, leveling it up and pumping your team is never a bad thing, and then if you get to the last level, like, I don't know, Flicker Wisp or some other evasive creature is probably, like, an absolutely devastating, almost one-shot kill clock on a on a big board that can just close out the game. So, yeah, I, I really like it, and as you said, it does stack well with other taxing effects that are already very popular in the legacy format so it has some places where it could possibly just slot right in if not in the main deck at least in the sideboard for the more like controlling matchups yeah a lot of those decks are now playing cards like esper sentinel to also kind of tax the opponent's mana as well and a lot of them to draw cards so there could be a mono tax style variant that curves you know these kind of cards together in certain ways to make it work well let's move forward to number four on our list we have 
portable hole. Portable hole gets rid of anything for a single mana. As long as it has mana value of two or less, Legacy's pretty efficient. That covers a pretty nice chunk of the format. What are you thinking about this one in Legacy, Joe? I think this is good. I think what makes it good is the fact that you can get it with Karn, the Great Creator, as the sideboard card with uh, the Wish ability. But beyond that, like it, it's possible that this could be outclassed by Prismatic Ending existing. But the fact that it's a permanent and an artifact really does make a big difference. Uh, it is worth noting that you cannot get this card, and I, I see this a lot, actually. Uh, you cannot get this card with Urza Saga, uh, because it is uh, white mana, not zero or one. So don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ur- Urza Saga, always, always confusing like that. This is a card that they spoiled this one really early. This was like the early previews, even before we got Modern Horizons 2. And when I first saw Portable, I was like, wow. I think this is, like, super legacy playable, super modern playable. This card has a lot of potential. But then we got Prismatic Prismatic Ending in MH2, and it kind of just, like, dropped down my list because Prismatic Ending has proven to be really, really powerful. Of course, Portable Hole is more efficient, uh, but it's much less flexible. Like, you can get something that costs two mana for one mana with your Portable Hole, but you can never get something that costs three mana like you can with Prismatic Ending, and you got the drawback of it may be dying. But I think the Karn point is a good one. Karn is very popular, and being able to have just this efficient sideboard removal spell that almost works like a uh, like an abrupt decay, like a, a white abrupt decay, a little bit worse, but similar. Like that gets a lot of stuff in the format for just a single mana, potentially giving you enough mana that you can Karn and tutor this out and answer something that maybe is going to like hit your Karn and kill your Karn that turn. So I think there's definitely potential there, and I, I don't know if this how much this is taken off at Legacy. I swear I saw some like tweets and so forth of like affinity decks making a comeback thanks to like thought Mm -hmm. monitor and so forth i don't know if that's an actual thing but those are decks that care about just having artifacts on the battlefield because you're trying to use actual affinity cards so if those decks do kind of become a real thing in legacy thanks to some of the modern horizon 2 stuff that's another place where this like goes up in value a little bit more absolutely yeah those decks are actually out there and doing fairly well enough they do die to a lot of like the sideboard cards that people are able to like bring in for example blue red delver is now playing copies of cards like meltdown to actually have to deal with the that deck so it's kind yeah of there's, funny. there's 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 really good artifact hate available I, I think in older formats but just the fact that decks are having to play cards like meltdown in their sideboard i guess that's a a testament to the strength of the affinity style decks post modern horizons too Absolutely. Let's move on to number three on our list. I've been waiting for this one. Wish. I am super curious what you think of this card. So Wish, for three mana, lets you play any card from your sideboard this turn. So we've seen Burning Wish be really good in Legacy, used in Storm decks. Is this a replacement for burning wish it's one more mana but you get more flexibility does it go somewhere else really curious what you have to to have to say about this one joe i think this primarily goes into a deck like ruby storm uh which is the the mono red burgy slash ruby medallion cost reduction uh jessica's will type deck yep Uh, and because that deck traditionally makes a lot of mana I mean, a lot of mana. So the 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 extra mana on Wish is probably not that bad uh, in that deck, and uh, it it is. It's very flexible. I I, I like this card a lot. Uh, when I first saw it, I thought, man, this is probably the most legacy playable card to set. And then, of course, we had a couple others that we're going to talk about here in a second. But uh, I think this is still very good. I think people will try it. I don't know if it will slot into existing Storm decks like the Epic Storm. Uh, but I do think it will be in the Ruby Storm decks for sure, because I think that flexibility uh, combined with that uh, fact that they just make so much mana that they don't really care uh, about the extra mana investment here that it's probably really good. Uh, I'm actually trying to like look at it from the standpoint of there's a, um, a Nick Fit build that I have played on occasion that was the Scape Shift Burning Wish variant. And I would like to play Wish instead because it lets me get lands. 
So yeah, that's actually that's actually a pretty meaningful upside. I think that sounds sweet. I wonder. One of the big differences between Wish and something like Burning Wish is Wish has a timing restriction. You have to play the card this turn. Something like Burning Wish, you can snag a card, put it in your hand, you know, use it at some point in the future. How big of a deal is that? Like, most of the time when you're casting a Burning Wish in, like, Ruby Storm, are you casting it during your combo turn and casting the card right away anyway, so that's really not an issue? Or is the fact that you can't hold onto the card and wait your turn a a bit of a drawback? It it can be a drawback. Uh, I think what also helps this card's favor a little bit is the fact that it interacts favorably with Past and Flames, uh, because this Mm -hmm. card does not self-exile itself. And uh, you can also use this card favorably with with Lion's Eye Diamond by uh, being able to cast the sideboard card with Lion's Eye Diamond uh, without having to worry about uh, cracking it in response to the actual casting of Burning Wish like you have to do with Burning Wish. Oh yeah, that's so. that's actually a huge upside with something like Pass in Flames. Yeah, that's a that's a really good call. That makes me even more excited for what this uh, card can potentially do in Legacy. And who knows, maybe there's room for some sort of like hybrid storm deck that plays both Burning Wish and this. I'm not sure, but I mean, storm players are very innovative, and I'm sure that they'll figure it out. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is that is very true of storm players. Uh, nothing amazes me like storm players' ingenuity. Any any group of players that can figure out a way to keep storming in Popper after every reasonable card with the word storm on it is banned, uh, hats off to, uh, to storm players. But let's move on. Number two on our list. We have a creature. Demolich. Demolich... A lot of blue mana, but really often potentially going to be free. A little reminiscent of something like Arclight Phoenix. Where does this one fit in Legacy, Joe? You pretty much just hit the nail on the head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. This is a blue card that you don't cast with blue, but spe- with blue spells is basically the way I look at this card. I don't see this card as a fair magic Delver style, Dreadhorde Arcanist style card. To me, this card is a hollow one want to aggressively pursue getting this into play pretty quickly and there's no other deck in the format that wants to cast three plus instances or sorceries other than arc light phoenix based decks so i have a feeling that this could slot into those decks very very easily and you're talking i'm gonna cast dark ritual dark ritual buried alive gut shot cast a demi lich get back some arc light phoenixes and i've got some suddenly i've got some power in play and so I've played enough of these of the like bizarre style like madness style decks in legacy and vintage where you have threats like hollow one that even though hollow one doesn't look like much on the surface as just a plain Jane four four it's a free four four and that's really what makes it strong so i i think that this is a similar kind of card i think it actually does have an impact in those kind of decks where you are wanting to cast a lot of spells on a single turn just to be able to get your arc light phoenixes into play and maybe you run a brain freeze or something like that and brain freeze yourself and then like cast a bunch of demi liches from your graveyard and <laughs> seems yeah, really I mean- gross <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can if you can cast those four spells, you're going to be able to just cast all of those from your graveyard and get back your Arclight Phoenixes. It, it's kind of eerie like how similar it is to Arclight Phoenix. They really care about the exact same kind of things. You do need one more spell to make Demolich free, but then Demolich also has this like flashback ability, which I don't think, as you said, is a the selling point of the card, but it is a little bit of free value once you get onto the battlefield, but it seems like, along with something like Arclight Phoenix, you can get off to some incredibly explosive starts with these cards, like having just multiple, you know, three, four power creatures on the battlefield on turn one, on turn two, some of them having haste, so definitely excited to see if uh, if players can figure out a way to make this work with something like Arclight Phoenix. Yeah, and, it, and it's worth noting that the, the last ability where you can recur it uh, is kind of hilarious in regards to things like force a will because they can't really force a will the first casting of it because you can just instantly exile the four instants or sorcerers you cast to so just cast it again for free so it's That's- got some insulation against counter magic 
Uh, that's that's actually a really good point, because, yeah, you got to cast four spells, and then you can exile those four spells, so it is pretty resilient there. And then, also, like, outside of Swords of Plowshare, sure, it has three toughness, but unless you're exiling it, it can come back from the graveyard potentially the next turn. If you're playing a Brain Freeze-style deck, you're probably going to have a lot of spells in your graveyard. It seems like it's something that you should be able to, similar to Arclight Phoenix again, rebuild turn after turn if your opponent does have some removal to slow it down. Right, and, and not only that... If you're presenting this as a threat to your opponent, then your Arclight Phoenixes are probably not getting bolted or plowed. And that's the other aspect of having a go-wide strategy where you have multiple threats in play. Yeah, that's actually a really good point, because a lot of the the Arclight Phoenix decks are pretty Arclight Phoenix reliant. I see some of them are, like, using the Witherbloom Apprentice, like, Chain of Smog combo, but as far as actual, like, attack you threats, it's just Arclight, which means, you know, a Surgical Extraction or something, all of a sudden those are all gone. Having an extra Arclight Phoenix and Demolich does offer some value there, I think. Yep, yep. Uh, let's move on to the number one Forgotten Realms card for Legacy, which is Aserac the Archlich. That's right. The number one card on our Legacy Countdown is a card that's all about venturing into dungeons, a mechanic that players aren't even sure is good enough for limited, but it's number one in Legacy. Joe, how are we using Aserac the Archlich in Legacy? So this is a one card combo with Aluren. Uh, so for those that don't, don't know what Aluren does, if you play EDH at all, you probably know what the card does, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it's very popular in that format. Uh, but Aluren is two green green, and it allows players to cast uh, CMC three or less creatures at instant speed whenever they want. Uh, and it's uh, so a Sararak basically allows you to cast him, put him into play, put his trigger on the stack, bounce him to your hand, venture into the dungeon. And you can just keep doing this and you can just keep going through essentially as long as you go, don't go through the tomb of annihilation, <laughs> you can just go through any of the other two dungeons and uh, the primary dungeon uh, that is the on the list of what you should be going through is the lost mind of Fandelver because that has a trigger on there that says uh, tar- each opponent loses one life. You gain one life or target opponent loses. I can't remember offhand which one it is, but it, it's a drain ability and so you can just keep doing that and drain your opponent now there is a weird uh uh, seth and i discussed this before we got recording that there is a weird uh rules safety valve in venture because some of the things i've seen come up about this have said well you know you can only drain them for as many cards as you have in your library what if they have like a ton of life more life than you have in your library somehow and how are you winning the game then with this card um, there's a weird rule safety valve that says if you're in the last room and you were to somehow venture again with the last room trigger on the stack, it will just let you start a new dungeon because it has to do something if you were to accidentally venture somehow on there in response to the ability. It has to do something and it can't do nothing. So it just completes the dungeon and start let you choose a new one. Uh, so you can... So- you win the game with no cards in your library if you really wanted to. <laughs> yeah, so so what that kind of means in practice is you the last the last room in Lost Mine of Fandelver is a room that says you have to draw a card. The room before that is the one that drains for one. That's the one that allows you to actually win the game. So if I'm understanding this right, you can uh, essentially not resolve that last room because yeah. you can keep flashing a Sarak in and just leave that draw a card room trigger on the stack and then go back through the first rooms of the dungeons again. So you could end up in a position where you had a whole bunch of like draw a card from uh, the Temple of Demotheon room on the stack <laughs> when you win the game with this by draining your opponent. Yeah, so I already, so far in Legacy, we're already seeing this uh, card ha- kind of have an impact. I'm seeing a lot of uh, screenshots and a lot of tweets from a lot of the Japanese grinders on Magic Online uh, that are trying this card out. C- the players that are intimately familiar with Aluren, because they, it's typically what they play. And I've, I've seen a lot of uh, interesting lists. Uh, one of the lists that was in my article this week was is in my article this week i should say is a nick fit Aluren variant uh, where their only other threat is uro uh and they're just playing a bunch of these they're playing like three or four of these cards to be able to win the game with with Aluren. 
Oh, that actually sounds super spy. I love Nick Fitz, one of my like favorite legacy archetypes, all the different variants of it. That might be one I might have to steal from the article and take out for a spin sometime. That sounds like <laughs> my kind of deck. Yeah. I think uh, for, for players that don't know Aluren, uh, Joe, why is a Sarak a big deal? Like before Adventures of the Forgotten Realms, how did Aluren actually win the game? So Aluren typically won the game either through the combination of a card called Cavern Harpy that bounces a creature, a blue or black creature, uh, and you could pay one life and return it to your hand. And then it also uh, it would just combo with a card. The typical card now is Ukima Stalking Shadow from uh, one of the Ikoria Commander decks. It's a, it has an ability that it, when it leaves the battlefield, it, it, the opponent loses however much life was equal to its power. And yeah, I think you gain that much life. And uh, basically it's a drain effect. Uh, similar, the deck used to run Parasitic Strix back in the day. It's typically a, a recruiter of the guard deck in some cases so that's the only like major downside of a sararak is that you cannot recruiter of the guard for this card but i don't think that's as big of a downside what this card tells me is that it does a lot of the similar similar same things that we saw with a card like thassa's oracle in regards to doomsday where it reduces the win condition to literally just one card and it allows you to have this like a plus b style combo that can be backed up by a good mid-range deck and uh Luren was already a really reasonable mid-range deck before this because it, that's the kind of cards you wanted to play if you played cavern harpy and uro you could just win the game with uh cavern harpy and uro by just drawing your deck uh, but with a sararak you don't need to do that now there is a downside to this card that if your opponent has a card like Swords of Plowshares, then they could possibly interrupt you. But you also have the ability to play like your own copies of Caracas. You also have the ability to play multiple copies of this card. And then at a, you're at a point where I can just simply just keep put an additional copy into play in response to a Swords of Plowshares and just keep going. And I, I think yeah, that's, that's powerful. Yeah, that seems super powerful. So it sounds like the the big upside is it kind of takes the Luren combo from being like a a three ish card combo down to like a, a two ish card combo. Really, basically, yeah, it's where you're reducing the amount of footprint you need for the combo to win the game. Suddenly, that frees up some spots in the deck for you to actually do other things. And I, I don't think this goes. There are versions of Luren that probably still want to play like the cavern harpy stuff you may even want to play one or two in the deck with a sararak just to have as like a safety valve because you know say your opponent does have a plow and you don't have another sararak you can flash in a cavern harpy and bounce him uh so that's still something that you might want to play because cavern harpy is still kind of good on its own but and that would still keep like the uro combo live and stuff right but if, uh, if you wanted to so there's some extra upside there too a little bit right that now i think that there are still some versions of the deck that are especially the Orion versions of the deck that are playing uh four colors and playing recruiter of the guard i think that those decks still exist i think this deck goes more this card goes into more of a focused bug like uh sultai style deck where you have access to cards like living wish is another card that came up uh, in a lot of discussion where you can stuff a copy of a Sararak into the sideboard and get it with Living Wish. Somebody also suggested a copy of Academy Rector in the sideboard where you could bring that in and sack it to something to get your Aluren into play. So Ooh, I, th I think that, it has potential in that kind of deck. Yeah, that that actually sounds very interesting. That kind of goes back to the, the Nick Fit Aluren hybrid type thing to some extent. It's kind of reminded yeah. me of like the Rector Fit style decks. Like you mash it all together. And yeah, Living Wish does seem like a, a really powerful option there. And I've seen some Aluren decks going down to even like more of a mid-range focus where they got Leovolds and Plague Engineers in the main deck and they kind of look like Sultai mid-range, but with Aluren just kind of being almost like, I don't know, a backup plan, the finisher, but they look like they can play a very real game plan. And it sounds like it's those more focused Sultai builds that might be able to most take advantage of the Sarak plan, especially if you have some wish action from the sideboard. Yeah, and I mean, you can always like adjust your plan if need be. You know, based on whatever your opponent's doing too. So I think having like a, a, a backup plan as well is also very good. But uh, I do think this card's going to see play. I, now, I don't know that it makes Aluren a tier one deck. I don't 
think that that's probably accurate because there's a lot of stuff going on in the format right now but i think it makes it a solid tier two deck that is definitely competitive and can win events and i think that's perfectly fine i i like cards like this that give a deck something where it's not like backbreakingly overpowered but it's just a nice option to have and I think that that brings us to the end of our top 10 adventures in the Forgotten Realms cards for Legacy. So uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. Joe, thanks so much to you for hanging out and doing it. Anything uh, people should be keeping an eye out for as far as stuff coming up on the website or that's up on the website? I, I don't know. Uh, this past week was <laughs> our Legacy Roundtable for the D&D edition talking about the legacy format with a bunch of various legacy content creators and players. Uh, so be sure to go check that out. Uh, it's very good information. I do these every about two or three months or so with people in the community. And it seems to go over pretty well because it lets people express their feelings and their thoughts on the format as it exists. So, and I know it's a little off topic, but you recently wrote a D and D adventure. If people are interested in seeing the D and D version of forgotten realms, where can they find your adventure, Joe? Uh, so if you go look out on the website, you can find it. There's an article. It's called the golden fish and adventure in the forgotten realms. You can also search for that on uh, DMs guild, uh, which is uh, dmsguild.com, and uh, you just search for the golden fish, and it will come right up. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I started working on that back in February, and I've uh, been worked on it for several months, and uh, it was great to see it finally come to fruition. Yeah, definitely, definitely really sweet and awesome timing, lining up with the Forgotten Realms set. So thanks so much for doing it. Definitely appreciate it. And everyone, now that you've seen our top 10 cards for Legacy, let us know what you think. Is there anything you're hyped to play in Legacy? Anything else that could show up on the list, maybe see play in such a powerful format? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks again for watching. Hope you all enjoyed it, and we will talk to you soon. Did you enjoy today's top 10 video? Well, we're going over all the different formats over the course of the next week, so make sure to check out the last top 10 video we did over here.